Hi, I'm Vizzy. I like making diagrams, so let's get right into it. So this is a diagram of the 12 Jungian archetypes. Now this video won't go super in depth talking about them, as I already did in the previous one, which I'll link in the cards above. So you should watch that one first. But in case you don't want to, I'll give a brief summary. This is a diagram of 12 character archetypes that all want fulfillment in a different way. In the soul category, they all seek something. In the body category, they want to leave a mark on the world. In the heart, they want to make connections. And in the mind, they want to build structure. Before we get started, we will be discussing 12 different anime girls, and that might mean we'll talk about some spoilers from each of these series. So you've been warned. So let's go ahead and get started. The Innocent. My example for The Innocent is Nezko from Demon Slayer. Now most commonly, I think this type has to do with the damsel in distress archetype. It's very cookie cutter, and it's pretty safe for male writers who don't know how to write women. So in Nezko's case, she's a slight subversion of this, as not only being the MacGuffin for Tanjiro's journey, she can still hold her own, but her personality ends up just being a younger sister, and one who cares about her friends and family, which is as basic as it gets. Next is Sage. My example is Nico Robin from One Piece. Now, of course, I had to give this to the archaeologist of the Straw Hat Pirates, and to a character whose dream is to find the real Poneglyph. Additionally, you'll see characteristics listed on the side. Sometimes the examples we use don't always represent the positives and the negatives. That's something to keep in mind when we get to later examples. Explorer. My example for the Explorer is Nami from One Piece. Nami is the navigator of the Straw Hat Pirates. Now in my last video, I also put Luffy as an explorer. And I think Nami explores a slightly different angle to it. If Luffy is the actionable freedom, she is the passive, compassionate freedom. Not that she can't hold her own, but I feel that hers is a little more nuanced. Next is the Outlaw. And of course, we have Jolene Cujo from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. A running theme in part six is freedom versus control. Although that might seem kind of obvious given that the story takes place in a prison for the most part. Even though what she's doing is illegal, right, breaking out of prison, she was of course framed. And she's put into situations where she has to protect herself and has to push back. Because if she doesn't, who will? You can even say that this rebellious spirit is something that carries through her whole lineage. Every Jojo, in one way or the other, has the sense that they are rebelling against something else. Whether that be as basic as good versus evil, or something that's maybe slightly more nuanced, like freedom and control. Next is the Magician, and I have Nobra from Jujutsu Kaisen. Now, Nobra is characterized in a way that I think is very unique when talking about anime girls. While yes, you could call her outspokenness a bit of a tomboy trait, the fact that she's comfortable with her femininity kind of goes against that, and the fact that she's a powerful Jujutsu sorcerer in her own right. Interestingly enough, this is where I would put most shonen protagonists, as I think we're used to male characters fulfilling some sort of power fantasy while female characters usually aren't written that way. And this could be due to a variety of reasons. But I think what Nobro shows us is it doesn't matter what your gender identity is. Any of these archetypes can work to describe a character. But I think especially in her case, going against the grain is a good thing. Next is Hiro, and we have Usagi from Sailor Moon. Aside from being an icon, Sailor Moon represents a very standard hero believes in the good of other people, and is kind-hearted and wants the best for you. Now, realistically, she could fall slightly closer to the lover trope, especially with her fascination for crushes and the thought of marriage, but I think Hero more succinctly displays who she really is. So if you want to write a likable hero, she's a good baseline. Next is Lover, and we have Toga from My Hero Academia. So while yes, you could put her here for her fascination for Deku, truthfully, her story is about intimacy. As with many My Hero villains, her story explores the prejudice that's in her world. Those with quirks that are deemed to be evil or evil adjacent are ostracized. And she's no exception. Because obviously we're talking about someone who ingests others' blood and transforms into them, but that really could just be used as an allegory for anything that is beyond your control. She didn't choose her quirk, nor did she choose to be ostracized. It's the fact that society gave up on her. And instead of giving her the benefit of the doubt, it corrupted her. And truthfully, most of the villains from My Hero are a reflection of this. They're not just bad for the sake of being bad. Even calling her a villain doesn't feel completely right. But even so, she's definitely the lover. Next is the Jester. We have Bulma from Dragon Ball. Now I will say this was kind of a difficult one to decide. Most Jesters are a little one-dimensional, very much the gag character. But I think Bulma displays a nuanced version of what this is. The Jester is not just someone who's funny, but they want to experience pleasure, a hedonist life, so to speak. And I feel she really represents this well. Bulma from the start of the series wanted very simple things. 
Like for instance, the main one, a boyfriend. Which if I'm not mistaken, she did mention marrying a prince, which she did end up doing. But besides that, she is one of the smartest characters in the whole series. So even though she lives a life of pleasure, she's still a genius inventor. She still gets to live a lavish lifestyle. And she has good friends and family to share that with. Also, she's hot, but I felt like that. Next is the regular. My example is Haruhi Fujioka from Oran High School Host Club. Now, Haruhi's isolation can feel different from other regulars or everyman. Because I think for Haruhi, it was more about being independent. It was finding a way to continue through life without her mother. It was finding a way to take care of herself. So she had to realize that she had to find a place and people to belong. That your independence can only get you so far. And truthfully, we're better with others. This idea of self-sufficiency and an almost monk mentality really just puts walls between you and everybody else. And then when you start wondering why exactly you're so lonely, you end up not seeing anybody because all you see is that your walls are up. Next is the caregiver. My example is Sakura from Naruto. Now, I wouldn't be the first to say it that Sakura's gotten a bad rap. And while part of that I think is misogyny, I think you can also chalk it up to, again, men not knowing how to write women. But she represents the archetypical giver, the person who gives as much as they can, being caring, loyal. I mean, when I was talking to one of my friends about this, they were saying she literally is a healer. Her powers manifested to help others. And I think that's really important to consider. Next is Ruler, and my example is Makima from Chainsaw Man. Now her role as the chief cabinet secretary's personal devil hunter is a significant reason why she's here. The fact that she manipulates Denji, and even though on the outside she can present as gentle and friendly, her ulterior motives are plain as day. I think she represents more of the tyrant side to the ruler, which to be fair, I think is pretty easy for anyone in an antagonistic role. And lastly, we have the artist. My example is Tsukimi from Princess Jellyfish. So she is an otaku with a dream to become an illustrator, which is a little on the nose with this archetype. But she represents a very formative part of the creative process and something that artists have to struggle with. This idea if their art is really just for them and understanding that it should be shared with others. That to live life and to be an artist, one of the most important parts is growing and experiencing more because sometimes the only way to fully express what you feel is by making art from it. So I was using anime girls to explain the young archetypes. Just like with the last video, where would you place yourself? Or where would you place your favorite anime character? And what do you think of my placement of these characters? Like I alluded to with some of them, I think there's minor overlap. I don't really think that one character only represents one archetype. Just that that one's more prominent, but I digress. So if you liked the video, please leave a like and subscribe. And of course, thank you for watching.